So this is episode one of the 12 Minor Prophets. It's a historical setting trying to set how the, these 12 prophets fit into the history of the Israelites. And Hosea was the first of the 12 prophets, and God told him to marry a whore to indicate to the Israelites that they were whoring against God. They were bowing to false idols and worshipping false gods. And God con- considered that whoring being unfaithful to him. And then we have all these other prophets that warned the people over time. And then the final one was Malachi. When they finally come back from exile from Babylon, then Malachi is now warning the people of Jerusalem that they're behaving badly again. It didn't take them long to get from there to here, along with two exiles in the middle, one to Assyria and one to Babylon. And now they're right back to being misbehaving. So Malachi is there to warn them that. And so Hosea is the first of the 12 prophets, Malachi is the last, and also the last book in the Old Testament. So after Malachi is 400 years of silence. God doesn't speak to them, God doesn't send prophets, and if he does, they're not recorded in the Bible. So there's 400 years of silence until God gave us his son Jesus, as told in Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. So that's how these 12 prophets fit. So around 330 B.C., That's 300 years before Christ was born. Already these 12 prophets were thought of as one unit, and the Hebrews kept them together as one book. While they are known as the minor prophets, this refers to the small size of their books and not at all implying that they are of minor importance. The Hebrews regarded these 12 shorter prophecies as parallel in importance to the major books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Note that the prophecies of Elijah and Elisha are not separate books because they were not writing prophets. They were major prophets in the early northern kingdom, that is Israel or otherwise called Ephraim, and their prophecies are included in the book of 1 Kings starting from chapter 17. It's important to do a quick review of the Hebrews to correctly fix these 12 minor prophets in history. So let's start way back with Abraham. So the Chaldeans, is, this is the Tigris River, the Euphrates River, and between here was called Mesopotamia. And the Chaldeans worshipped many gods and goddesses. And Abraham was originally called Abram. So in Genesis 12, God told Abram to move from Ur to the, of the Chaldeans to a place that God would show him. His was a journey of about 2,000 miles from his homeland. So Abram traveled up to Haran from the Ur of the Chaldeans up through here to Haran, which is modern Iraq, then across to Syria, and then down to Sheshem in Canaan, modern Israel, where he settled. Then Abram worshipped the one and only God Most High. He was 75 years old when he settled there, and he was childless. So Abram's wife, Sarai, was barren, so she gave Abram her Egyptian handmaiden to bed. And Abram was 86 when Hagar gave birth to her son, Ishmael, who became the father of today's Arab nations. So here's Abraham, Sarah, and Haggai who gave birth to Ishmael. So Abraham's nephew, Lot. So Abraham's brother had a child, a son called Lot, and so he was the nephew of Abraham. So Abraham's nephew, Lot, lived in Sodom, which the Lord destroyed with fire from heaven. And Lot's daughters then thought they were the only humans alive. And so they got their father drunk and slept with him. And they gave birth to two boys who became the fathers of the tribes, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And Moses has to fight these guys later on. So God renamed Abraham to Abraham and his wife to Sarah. God said Abraham would be the father of a host of nations. And God gave Sarah a son Isaac when Abraham was 99 years old. Abraham means exalted father, and Abraham means father of multitude. So here's Abraham, Sarah, and she gives him Isaac. So Isaac grew up, married Rebekah, and had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. So Esau was a, a hunting man, a big, big guy, hairy, strong built, and a redhead. And Jacob was, a, I guess, a scrawnyish guy, um, very pale skin, no hair at all. I mean, the two of them were chalk and cheese. So Esau sold his firstborn birthright to Jacob for a pot of soup. And so Esau was very uh, nonchalant about his birthright. He was the firstborn, and one day he had been out hunting, came in, and he was hungry, and he said he would sell his firstborn birthright to Jacob 
for a pot of the soup that Jacob was cooking. So he did. And Esau ultimately became the father of the Edomites. So the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites become a headache for the Israelites later on. Then Jacob had to run for his life when Esau found out that Jacob had also cheated him out of his firstborn blessing from Isaac. So all of these, as they came, as the children were born, they would give the firstborn a a, a very strong blessing, which God then um, uh, acknowledged and carried through. But now Jacob cheated and stole Esau's um, birthright blessing from Isaac, which kept Jacob in God's chosen lineage. And he had to run to Haran in Upper Mesopotamia to Rebekah's brother, Uncle Laban. So Rebekah had a brother, uh, Rebekah had a brother Laban who lived up there in Haran. And so that's where Jacob ran to Upper Mesopotamia to Rebekah's brother, Uncle Laban. And there Jacob fell in love with Rachel, Laban's daughter. And Jacob worked for seven years to claim Rachel as his bride. But on the wedding night, the father Laban cheated and dressed up Leah in clothes and veils and whatnot. So um, Jacob didn't know he was getting Leah. And of course, the saddest line in the Bible is in the morning and the sun came up and Jacob looked at his adored wife and lo, it was Leah, says the Bible. So he worked another seven years for Rachel. So Laban said, well, you know, the oldest has to get married first, and so you can work another seven years for Rachel, the youngest. So Jacob was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of which was Joseph, we all know him, of the coat of many colors, who was sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt. So here's Jacob, here's Jacob. So he had 12 children. He got Leah, the older sister, the ugly sister, and then he worked another seven years for Rachel, and these are their handmaidens. So he had the 12 tribes. Everybody knows the first four, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, the first four. And then um, Rachel couldn't have any children, so she said, here, take my handmaiden. And she had Dan and Naphtali. So Rachel still doesn't have any children. So Leah thought, well, that's not a bad idea. So she gave her handmaiden to Jacob, and he got, uh, she got Gad and Asher from that. And so then Leah got Issachar and Zebulun from, the, from, you know, from Jacob, and finally, God opened Rachel's womb, and she had Joseph of many colors that got stuck in Egypt, and she had Benjamin, and she died giving birth to Benjamin. So from Benjamin, we get King Saul. We also get the Apostle Paul. He was the, the Pharisee Saul, and then God, Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and said, why are you persecuting me? And so Saul became Paul. So from Benjamin, we have King Saul and Paul. And then from the Levites on Leah... We got Moses and Aaron, and from them we get the Levites, who were the, 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 the priestly tribe. Uh, from Aaron we get the priests and the high priest. Zadok was King David's high priest. And then we have from Judah, we get King David, King Solomon, and all the kings of Judah, because the, the, the northern kingdom disappears up there, and from King David we get Jesus. So this is how the tribes all fall apart. Okay, so he was the father of the 12 tribes, of which one of them was Joseph. So Joseph rose to power. They send him into captivity. The brothers sell him to a caravan that's going to Egypt. But he nevertheless, you know, Joseph is one of God's chosen. And Joseph rose to power in Egypt because he could accurately interpret the Pharaoh's dreams of seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And during the famine, Joseph brought his family of 70 members to live in Goshen. But instead of leaving when Joseph died, they liked Goshen and stayed. So eventually a later pharaoh, who didn't personally know or even care about Joseph, enslaved them, and the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years. So here's, here's the, you see that the Nile, Nile Delta, here's the Nile is one river, then it breaks up into a multitude of tributaries, and this is an enormously fertile land. So Joseph kept, brought his family through from 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 Judah, which was having a famine, through to Israel, which where he had stored up enough food for um, for the whole country actually, and so he puts his family here in Goshen because it's such a rich place. And the Israelites were livestock people; they kept goats and and uh, camels and sheep and whatnot. So this was perfect for them. And it was interesting. I read once that the the Nile, the famine was caused not by no water, because of course the Nile was coming in. 
it was caused by floods. So floods caused the destruction of the crops, which caused the famine. And Joseph brought his people and settled them in Goshen over here. So after 430 years in Egypt, God heard the cry of the Israelites and rescued them. God rose up Moses, who demonstrated God's ten plagues, including the killing of all firstborn. So pretty much the Pharaoh, when he lost his kill, kid, he kicked them out of Egypt, and they left around 1446 BC. So from Sukkot, they followed God as a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And at Pi Ha Hirot, they passed through the Red Sea. And at Dop Ka, God sent manna and quail. And at Mount Sinai, Moses received the Ten Commandments. And then he traveled up to Kadesh uh, Barnea. Now, this whole trip only took a few weeks. They say two weeks, but let's say even worst case, it took longer. It was very, they, moved, they were moving pretty swiftly to get to Kadesh Barnea. And here Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land. But only Caleb and Joshua, when the spies came back, only Caleb and Joshua wanted to proceed and fight for Canaan. So you see, this is the Philistine land here. It's actually higher than this as well. It's Ashkenoth right up here. And so the, uh, this is the Philistine land. And you can imagine they, they, they were anywhere between 8 and 12 feet tall. So you can imagine when these 12 tribes came back and said, yeah, no, the land is great, running with milk and honey, but they had to pass through the Philistine land to get back to Kadesh Barnea. And no doubt they, that put the fear of God into them. But nevertheless, Caleb and Joshua said, listen, God said we can go, let's go. And the rest of them said, heck no, we're not going to do that. So the people refused to fight for the promised land. So God let them wander in this wilderness around here. For 40 years. It's not too bad. It's got a bit of water, but still, they wandered around there for 40 years. So Edom, as you remember from Esau, from Esau here's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the brother, his twin brother Esau. So you'll remember them. So when they'd been wandering around the, the wilderness for 40 years, and Moses started, he, uh, God said, okay, gave Moses permission to move out now. By this time, you see, the Philistines were there, and they would pick on the Jews in the wilderness. And there was the, the Amalekites lived around here, and they would raid the Jews. So even though the, uh, as the old people died off, they had refused to go and fight, the young people were learning to fight because they were having to fight off the Philistines and the Amalekites over here. And when God finally gave them permission to move on and go into Canaan, um, Moses wanted to go past Edom, and Edom refused. So Edom from Esau would not allow Moses to traverse his land. And in fact, he even sent an army to stop them. And so they were forced to go around. So Moses had to go all the way around like that. And God was very angry with Edom for, for stopping because, you know, they, they're the descendants of Esau, which is, okay, Jacob was bad blood, but still they, they're the same bloodline. So God was angry with Edom and said, I will take you out. And in fact, he did take him out. Uh, Herod, the king, King Herod, that tried to take out Jesus and killed all the babies under two years old, he was an Edomite. And that's why he was hated by the Jews, because he wasn't really a pure Jew. He was an Edomite. So Moses had to go around Edom. And then he fought his way through the Moabites and the Ammonites, which were there. Now, the Moabites and Ammonites, remember, they were descendants of Lot's daughters, and, and Sodom and Gomorrah is around here someplace. It's not, not shown, but it's around here on the Dead Sea. So Moses fought his way up through the Moabites and the Ammonites until he parked opposite uh, here by Mount Nebo. And then Moses captured the east side, which was finally allotted to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. And Mo Moses saw the promised land. They, God told him to climb Mount Nebo, and he did, and he could see the promised land from up there. But he wasn't allowed in, and he died when he was 120 years old. And then Joshua took over leading the Israelites, and he was a mature young man. And he had been with Moses as his young assistant, and had been in the tabernacle when the glory of God used to cover it. And so, you know, back in the day, uh, when you were given to a priest to be brought up in, in the ministry, so to speak, you were like three years old. I mean, Samuel, when his mother, when his mother weaned him, and they usually weaned him about three years old, then she gave him to the temple. So he, they, they, when they come and work for 
or assistance to these great great men. They they little toddlers, and they bring them up from there to be uh, to train them up, you know, to be what they need them to be. So Joshua had been around all this time, and when the the glory of God covered the tabernacle, Joshua was right there. So he knew all about the glory of God, and that's why I guess at Kadesh Barnea, when the people refused to go, Joshua said, "No, let's go." I mean, if God is with us, if God is for us, who can be against us? Because he had experienced the power of God when when it covered the tabernacle. Anyway, so here was uh, uh, Moses at Mount Nebo, and then they parked opposite Jericho. So Joshua did the same as Moses. He sent spies across the Jordan River to get reports of the enemy's morale. Now, don't forget they had been fighting their way Moses under Moses. They had fought their way past the, the Moabites and the Ammonites up to Jericho, which is about here somewhere. And so they were flattening them. And so the people were hearing about the, these Israelites marching up and just flattening everybody in their path and that their God was helping them. And so by the time they got to Jericho and uh, Joshua sent spies across to get the report of their morale, their morale on this side was pretty low. They were pretty nervous. So by this time, the Israelites had defeated the land east of the Jordan, and those living west of the Jordan were nervous. And so Joshua led Israel across the Jordan River and captured Jericho. We all know the story of the walls falling down. Then Joshua divided the north and the south and started his southern campaign. So once he took Jericho, he, he, he wanted to divide the country in half like that so that the, he got the southern half and the, and the top half. So he, to do that, he, he was aiming for the coast. And so he started his southern uh, campaign by coming, he took all the lands of the Arabah, and then he came down the hill country all the way down to uh, the Negev, to Kadesh Barnea, where um, Moses had originally sent in the 12 tribes, and then across to Gaza, where the Philistines lived, and up he took the lowland and the hill country, and now he, he had split the country in two. And then when the, the, the kings of the north joined forces to attack the Israelites, he then went into his northern campaign, took the rest of the Arabah, took the hill country of Israel, the lowlands of Israel, and now he had the entire country as far as Baal-Gadad there and the Negev down here. And then once he had it, the Israelites smashed all the Canaanite cultural elements like idols and fertility groves and worship altars as they went through. And Joshua led the Israelites for 28 years, through seven years of conquest and seven years of settlement. And he retired and died at 110 years old and was buried in the mountains of Ephraim. So that's around about here somewhere. And Joshua has allocated the land to the 12 tribes by lottery. By 1250 BC, nearly 200 years have passed since they left Egypt in 1446 BC, and the Canaanites were mostly defeated and the Israelites settled in Canaan. And when I say mostly defeated, not every little town and, and city had, a little walled city had been overrun. So there were still Canaanites living in the land, although God said wipe them all out because God knew that they would eventually start uh, misbehaving with the, the Canaanites, who were very godless and, and worshipped many gods. And so God told them to wipe them all out, but they didn't. So they were mostly defeated and the Israelites settled, and they settled it by lottery. Moses came up, took the Moabites and the Ammonites out, and then Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh said they wanted these three bits of land because they looked good. And then Dan was given this. So this was the, the Judah, Simeon, and Benjamin, which became Judah. And uh, this became the ten tribes up here. And then Dan was given this spot here, but you can see they're pretty close to uh, the Philistines. Dan, remember in the Bible, when God wanted Moses to build a tabernacle, he gave all the skills of working with wood and iron and stone and gold and silver, all those, those kinds of skills they gave to Dan. So Dan was very, very highly skilled uh, craftsman. And so no doubt the Philistines, the, the Goliaths of this, in this, in, living in this part of the land, would raid Dan and take their stuff because they had beautiful stuff. And the people complained like crazy. And eventually God did send them Samson. He was a Danite. And he was visiting in Gaza. No doubt uh, Samson liked the big Philistine women. And he was there when they uh, attacked him. 
so he was in Gaza. So he actually broke the gate out of the city wall. Now, you know, back in the day, the gates were tall enough to take a camel. So they were 15, 20 feet high. They were six inches thick. I mean, they were solid, solid gates. And Samson just ripped the whole gate out. And instead of dropping it there, he actually uh, walked it all the way to Hebron and dumped it outside Hebron, which is like 36, 40 miles or something, dumped it outside Hebron and then went to Hebron. And I wondered at first why he did that. But of course, once the the cities were, the, the, the land was divided up amongst the tribes, they created six sanctuary cities where you could run if someone was chasing you. Like no doubt the Philistines were chasing Samson when he ripped their gate off. And so there was uh, these six, Hebron, Sheshem, Kadesh, Golan, Ramoth, and Bezer on either side of the Jordan River. So you could bolt to one of these. If, if, if you accidentally killed your neighbor, you know, you're swinging your axe and, and you kill the neighbor, you could bolt to one of those cities until the whole crime was worked out, whether you were guilty or not. And so that's what, and then the Levites, you'll notice the Levites didn't get any of the land because they were given cities when, within each of these these land masses, these tribes, the Levites were given land and cities so that each tribe then had a priestly institution. So there's the allotment. And so once Joshua died, unfortunately the land wasn't overly peaceful because not all the Canaanites had been evicted from the promised land. So this period introduces us to the book of Judges. As the tribes become lesser people, like the Israelites, and were more just fragmented tribes, thinly connected by religion and bloodlines, and living in uneasy proximity to each other. So I'm not going to go over this period of about 200 years. It's basically all battles until the monarchy is set up with King Saul as the first king around 1000 BC. So you can see Joshua is 1250 BC, and now it's 1050. So it's 200 something years later. So here we have Jacob. And here from Rachel, we got Benjamin, which gave us King Saul. And from Leah, we had Judah, which gave us King David, who was the next king after Saul and his whole line. So here's how to remember the 12 tribes of Israel. So you should know the first four always. It's Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. If anyone asks you, you should be able to rattle off Leah's first four kids, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Then the next are the three-letter tribes, Dan and Gad. And the next are the A to Z tribes, Asher and Zebulun. Asher and Zebulun. And then the three funny reminders. You get Benjamin goes riding in a car, so that's Issachar, for six hours. And then he needs a nap because he's so tired, so he needs a nap. So these are the three sort of funny. Benjamin rides in a car, so you get Issachar, and he needs a nap, Napsali. And, of course, the last but not least is Joseph, and he's multicolored. So that's how you can easily remember the 12 tribes. It's Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, and then Dan and Gad, and then Asher and Zebulun, and then Benjamin, Issachar, Naphtali, and Joseph. And it's amazing. If you just read that once or twice, you'll remember these 12 tribes forever. You won't know them in the order they were born, but you will know the 12 tribes. So since Joshua, Israel had been settled for over 500 years when Assyria rose to power as an empire from 900 BC to 600 BC, bringing about the period of these 12 prophets. And now, when you look up Assyria, it actually started 2,500 years BC. Um, but they were, this was their heartland. Here's Nineveh on the east side of the Tigris, and they hung out around here. Then they got a little bit more powerful, and so they took over the odd little city and the odd little city, and eventually they took over this much. But So they'd been around 1,500 years when they started rising to power and becoming an empire. And so this is the part that really interests us when they're from 900 to 600. And the ancient tribes were terrified of the Assyrian Empire. They were brutal. They had mastered the art of torture. Those that weren't killed in battle were trampled underfoot, beheaded, hanged. Amp they amputated their limbs. They riddled them with arrows, gouged out their eyes flayed off their skin, and impaled people on sharp poles. And they bragged about it. They stuck it all over their walls. They made sure everybody knew this is what we did. Here's the two Assyrian soldiers impaling someone. And they would stick it up under their ribs, making sure they missed the heart. Otherwise, that would kill them. You really didn't want your enemy to die quickly, heaven forbid. So they would stick it up to the left, and so their body would just hang with their rib cages. It's just ghastly. I mean, the Assyrians, they had mastered the 
the art of torture. So the Assyrians de deliberately flaunted their cruelty as part of their psychological warfare. You could tell where the Assyrian army had passed. There were miles and miles of people impaled on poles. So they didn't just do a few. They, the whole city, they would impale a whole lot on poles. And they loved their mass execution. As a variation on the impalement, the Assyrians also invented crucifixion. So you had God, Abraham, the, the, the handmaiden Hagar, Ishmael, giving rise to the Arab nations and Islam. And then Abraham, which is God was chosen, this is, was God's anointed line, had Sarah who get Isaac, who finally go to King David, Jesus and Christianity, and King David Judaism. So this was God's anointed line. So Armenian Christian women crucified 1915 to 1970 by Muslim Turks. These are real photos of real women. We cannot forget that. This is Islam from Hagar. And of course, this, when Jonah came along and God said to Jonah, who was living happily down here, I want you to go up to Nineveh and tell them I'm going to take them out. You can understand Joseph's reluctance. I mean, he got on a ship and he headed off to Spain. Because, I mean, this is what you saw as you were walking, as he would be walking along to Nineveh. This is what he would see. People impaled, people crucified. So the poor guy, he said, uh, maybe not. And he just took off on a boat. So traditionally, these 12 prophetic works were arranged in the estimated chronological order. So the books during the Assyrian power were Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. And then written during the decline of the Assyrian Empire were Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And then the post-exile, when they came back from exile in Babylon, was Haggai, Zechariah, and Manukkah. So there was the exile to Assyria and an exile to Babylon. Because, you know, heaven forbid the Israelites should have changed their behavior. Ancient Israelites. So these 12 prophets were active during the Assyrian Empire's peak of 150 years of so they peaked for 150 years, and the prophets were warning their people about a possible exile if they did not repent. So I changed this, the date on the timeline of the 12 prophets here to the order that they appear in my Bible. If you go to Google, you get some different dates, some similar, but I just chose to go with my Bible because I'm going to be doing this study from my Bible. So 875 BC, we have Joel warning the southern kingdom uh, about the capital Jerusalem to behave themselves. In 810, Jonah is told to go to Nineveh and he heads off across the Mediterranean in his stead. 800, Amos is talking to the northern kingdom. Now he's warning the 10 northern um, tribes to behave themselves. And interestingly, the capital of Samaria is in Manasseh's territory and not in, let me go all the way back up here, sorry. Uh, so here's Ephraim, and here's uh, Samaria right up here in the Manasseh's territory. So whereas Jerusalem is down here in Judah's, they didn't pick any of the cities here. They, they chose Samaria in Manasseh. I thought that was quite interesting. So we have Amos talking to the northern kingdom, and then Hosea warns the northern kingdom, and he does it for 60 years, and then Micah is warning the southern kingdom. Finally, in 722, Israel, the northern kingdom, is exiled and deported to Assyria with after nearly 80 years of warnings, if you take it from Amos to the northern kingdom. It's 80 years of warnings. I mean, if you want to take it all the way up here, then it's even more warnings. So off they go into exile. And then in 713 BC, now they're during the decline of Assyria's power. So now they, they, he's Nahum warning Nineveh again because... Jonah warned them there and they repented. So now they've clearly gone back on their repentance. And then Zephaniah to the southern kingdom, Habakkuk also. Um, and, but his words, he's more like he's addressing God about the issues more than a prophecy to the people. And then Babylon lays siege. So they've had 630, they had a warning from Zephaniah and Joel warned them 875. So Babylon now lays siege to them. And from Joel to the siege is 278 years. And then, of course, we get the, they were taken off to da Babylon, where we get Daniel in the lion's den was in Babylon. And the Magi, when these three wise men, as we call it, fondly call it, came from Babylon to 
Jerusalem to Herod to say, gee, we've heard that the king of the Jews has been born. And, of course, Herod, being an Edomite, immediately starts killing children in the hopes that he catches Jesus and kills him. So this is how they Babylon still stays relevant in the Bible. And then in 586, Obadiah is now warning Edom because remember uh, Moses, when Moses came out of Egypt and asked if he could travel through and the Edomites said no. And you know, God's got a long memory. It's 860 years since God got mad at them and said, uh, you know, you, you really should let my people in. Well, it's 820 if you take the 40 years in the desert off. Um, but it's 800 years and God still remembers he wants to punish Edom. So he sent Obadiah to, to warn them first because God is a good God. He warns us first before he smacks us down. 537 BC, King Cyrus allows the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. It's now the post-exile era. And we have Haggai to Judah to rebuild the temple. Zechariah also at the same time, the two of them are prophesying to rebuild the temple. And then finally, 100 something years later, Malachi is in Jerusalem and he's complaining to them and warning them that they have become lax in their religious and social behavior. So 100 years later, they've all come and settled down and they're rebuilding stuff. But once again, after 100 years of peace, they start getting lax in their behavior. So in summary... We have Abraham left Ur the Chaldeans and settled in Shechem. Abraham gives birth to Isaac, gives birth to Jacob, who's the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, of which the most important is Joseph. So Joseph is sold by his brothers into captivity in Egypt, and he brings his family of 70 to Goshen during the famine. After 430 years, God raises Moses, brings about the 10 plagues, and we get Pharaoh's firstborn die, so he kicks him out of Egypt, luckily. Moses then sends 12 spies into the promised land. And the people won't fight when they see the size of the Philistines. And so God makes them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And then Moses decides now they're going to finally go into Canaan. And, but he's denied access by Edom. And so he has to circle all the way around Edom. And God is very angry with Edom. And Edom, remember, the father of Edom is Esau. Esau, Jacob's brother. It goes way back. So then Mo Moses fights the Canaanite tribes east of the river Jordan, which are the Moabites and Ammonites, which are the, the father of those were Lot, Lot's daughters. And then Joshua fights the Canaanite tribes west of the Jordan River. And then he assigns all the land by lottery. 500 years later, the Assyrian Empire rises to power. So the, the, the Israelites have been living happily in this land for 500 years when the Assyrians rise to power. And these 12 prophets start warning the people of their iniquities, and God threatens them with exile. The people don't listen, so finally, Assyria invades the 10 northern tribes, which are also called Israel or Ephraim in the Bible, and exiles the people to Assyria. Then the prophets Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah warn Judah, because now that the others are in Assyria, the prophets start warning Judah of their iniquities with a threat of exile to Babylon. Jeremiah was a big big major prophet during the same time but we're not doing the major prophets we're doing the minor prophets so finally Babylon invades Judah the southern kingdom and takes the people to exile in Babylon and so after the exile they're there for 70 years then the prophets Haggai and Zechariah urge the people to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and they start doing it under Ezra and Nehemiah and finally a hundred years later Malachi urges the people in Jerusalem to behave themselves because they've had so much peace and contentment. They're living in Jerusalem. They've got their little temple going. They've got their walls up. They're nice and safe. And so then they start messing around again. So this is a study of the 12 minor prophets. Of course, the major prophets were also warning Israel and Judah during the same time frame. Seems the people ignored all the prophets, whether they were major or minor. Then also, as I do each one, because I'm going to do each prophet separately in a playlist, and so as I do each one, I'll put this same historical setting at the beginning of each. So if you're just starting on, on Nahum, you're going to get the same episode. So if you go from Hosea to the next one, then feel free to skip this historical setting. So follow me to episode two. Thank you very much. God bless.